I mean, you, you will need to learn a couple of programming languages, but learning them at the same time, it's a little bit hard. So we kind of shift. So we will start today with Haskell, but just very basics. And then we will shift to Golang and then we will spend uh, two or three weeks with Golang such that you get, uh, you know, proficiency. Um, Golang is quite simple language, to be honest. Uh, if you know C and C++, uh, as I told you before, Golang is quite easy. The only, um, th there are two things which are, yeah, there are a couple of things, but there are two main things that are a little bit confusing. So the first thing is that the type uh, notation is turned around. So we don't say int a, we say a int. Uh, and, you know, that's simple, very simple, but it gets kind of used to like when you're reading code, your mind, if you get used to reading C, C++, reads the first thing as a type and the second as a, as a argument, as a name of the variable. And it gets a little bit getting used to it. And you cannot just do it in like 15 minutes. You, you need to spend some time getting used to reading the types the other way around. Some programming languages have that notation. And once you do that, you will probably like the, the Golang notation uh, more. Uh, it's the same in Rust. Uh, it, it kind of makes more sense. Uh, if, if you you know change your mind, then maybe you will like it more. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is there is no concept of um, classes or you know everything is sort of done in functions, which is very similar to Haskell. So uh, that gets used to as well, like, you know, if you were doing C, you had structs and functions, but then as soon as you move to C++, you have this concept of a class and then you group things into class. And here you don't have that. You again are back to structs and, 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 and functions. You do have methods on, on structs, but yeah. So anyway, uh, we, will, we will come back to that. Um, so I will start, let me... Uh, let me open this. And I will start the presentation. Come on. So this is. Um, yeah, we can do it this way. So that's the presentation for today. If you use the Manti with the code, you should be able to join in. And then we continue. If you have any questions, just uh, use the chat uh, or use the microphone if you want. All right. So uh, course logistics. Um, we have... Um, the issue tracker and the announcements are done through the issues. So we've done that um, already. We there was a you know shift from for the course. Uh, I've done it this way, but still some people showed up on Thursday into Zoom, which means not everyone is reading the announcements, which also means not everyone is in the course. So if I go to the members list um, and I check. Uh, you have to uh, request access, right? Not everyone is here yet. So you have to request an access. And the reason, there are two reasons for that. First one is that you can then subscribe to the, you can subscribe to labels. So you can say subscribe to announcements and then you will basically get the no notification every time there is an announcement. But then there is more. So if you go to the wiki, there is kind of a set of exercises for Haskell, so called tasks. There will be a tab called assignments. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if I do the assignments in, through the wiki or whether the assignment will be just in the repo and then you just fork the repo. Most likely the assignments will be done through the repo, but um, if you want to have a feel, this is for example, um, a set of simple functions that the tasks are asking and some of them or something like that will be in the assignment, the, the first assignment for Haskell. So there will be a little bit about recursion. There will be a little bit about like uh, using the type system and re-implementing some of the uh, some of the um, standard building functions using something else. Uh, so the deadline usually we will have about three weeks. So from the moment the assignment is ready, 
uh, you will have about three weeks to, to finish it. And then we will have another one or two weeks for peer review. So then you will have to check other people's um, assignments. So um, we will kind of try to follow a two or three week cycle. Uh, if you look at the courses, um, co course lectures, we have uh, sort of like a, a deadline at the end of two week period. So we have kind of a deadline here and deadline here. Um, then we have a deadline here and deadline here. And those are every two weeks. Uh, so two deadlines are like uh, four weeks. So that's what the assignment cycle will be. Uh, it will not be for every sprint, but it will be for every uh, two sprints. So as I'm saying, like the first assignment for Haskell will be around early, um, yeah, early February, probably. Um, this is um, planning that we on, only using the one week for the um, for Golang. I'm not sure if we will stick to this to this schedule. Maybe we will have to push this a little bit further, which will push everything else a little bit further, right? You will notice that we have a bit of slack. So not everything is planned, you know, up to the last lecture. So we have a couple of weeks slack such that we can push things forward. As I told you in the first lecture, we are running the course for the first time. We also coordinating with the, uh, with the cloud course and Golang. So I'm not sure how fast can we move. Uh, this is like a preliminary schedule. Uh, most likely it will be a bit too ambitious. So we may need to push things down uh, as we move forward. Uh, those tasks, are, uh, there are two reasons for you to, to check the tasks. You don't have to do them, uh, you can do them. And if you do them, you can put them into the repo. So those are kind of non-compulsory tasks that are for, you know, for students who want to play with stuff. Um, assignments are compulsory. So assignments you have to do. Uh, if you cannot do the full assignment, do as much as you can, right? So if you cannot complete the entire assignment, but you can do like two or three functions, just do what you can. Uh, the tasks, again, like you don't have to do the whole thing. Like th those are not compulsory at all. Like you don't need to even do one. But if you want, you can do them. And if you do them, you can put them into this assignment folder, into this assi assignment repo, and they will count as extra, right? So you know, um, for C, you have to do everything we tell you to do. For B, you have to show some initiative. And for A, you have to be like super creative and add a lot of uh, your own uh, individual kind of um, thinking into things. So th those tasks, uh, you can consider them as so some, something like for B, right? So if you do them, put them in, it will be counting towards kind of a better grade, but they are not compulsory. Like to, to get like C, you don't need to do them. Like if you just do the assignments and the project, you can comfortably get C, right? Um, so that's how it is. Like we're not supposed to tell you what to do for B and A, but this is kind of like a hint, like, okay, do something extra, then that, that will be fine. Um, all right, so any questions about that? No questions, all right. So submission system I to told you about, like we, uh, we played with the uh, peer grade, which is like a commercial tool. Uh, some courses and some lecturers and NTNU use it. Um, it's not perfect and it doesn't allow us to express the self-evaluation thing. So what we did, we had a bachelor project um, two years ago and the bachelor group developed like a submission system for us. We've been maintaining it. We had a couple of other students working on it. Uh, and we are fine tuning some group assignments and some uh, notification systems, which should be ready in like two, three weeks. And then we, I will post it. And the, uh, our submission system is kind of integrated with the GitLab such that you will use your GitLab uh, username and then you will create yourself uh, your additional account. Um, and then you will use uh, the submission system to do the, the assignment submissions for self-evaluation and peer review. Um, those of you who are good in Golang already or who will be good in Golang in a couple of weeks and you want again to score some extra points, I will announce you where the re code repository is and you can issue uh, patches or you know, pull requests or fix some bugs. Um, the system is written in Golang and we use Bootstrap for 
for UI. So it, it is quite simple. Uh, and as it, like the, the coding is simple. The, the system is quite complex already because it has a lot of features. So it's quite a largish code base. But the you know the programming is in Golang and most of the stuff is just Golang. Uh, we're using Golang forms. We limited uh, JavaScript to minimum, and we're using Bootstrap for the UI. So um, if you're keen to learn more about Golang, or if you like Golang and you want to play a little bit with the tool, or if you notice some bugs in the system, uh, yeah, you can kind of put patches yourself, uh, and that of course will count in favor for you in the cloud course and in this course. Uh, so I'm sure Christopher will be happy. Um, yeah, the course has a peer review, so I will talk more about it later once we have the system going. Uh, the basic idea is you will basically use um, um, to read somebody else's assignments and check if they've done everything correctly. There are two reasons for that. Um, main reason is that reading code, reading somebody else's code is a skill that you will use 80%, 90% time of your work life. Uh, you will not be producing code from scratch. You will be adding code to somebody else's code and ability for you to read code is super important. And that is not very, um, you are not exposed to reading somebody else's code a lot through the, throughout your university education. So this peer review system is basically helping with that. So you will read other people um, code. Uh, so that's one main reason. The second main reason is that you will see how others solve the same problem. So your idea of solving it might be really good or it might not be very good. And then by reading somebody else's uh, solutions to the problems, you will learn. You will learn like the strength of your own solution or your own weaknesses, right? Uh, if you've noticed that somebody did something less uh, efficient or you know more difficult to read, you can put it into comments. You can kind of teach somebody else like, oh, hey, maybe you should simplify it to this, right? Um, so it's about like making it more social. Like programming, you know, it's not really an individual activity. Programming is a very social activity. We produce code in groups of people. Uh, we very rarely produce individual uh, code uh, as, as individuals, unless we write some short scripts, right? Again, scripting languages, programming languages. So writing programs usually requires a group of people collaborating. Uh, writing short scripts for your own personal use or for you know sim simple tasks, that's different. Uh, that's scripting, that's not programming. Um, so um, the peer review system is sort of uh, helping us to, to achieve that. Yeah, I talked about the GitLab PROC 206 assignments. Uh, so that means we can move on. Um, we have a couple of things to cover today. Uh, the first more abstract one is um, the concept of um, how we think and how we discuss programming language. Um, so of course we have a syntax. So that's what you are familiar with from C and C++ and maybe some other languages. And that's what you focus on initially, right? You are exposed to a programming language through the syntax of that language. Um, but if you, um, if you need to parse it, if you need to do something with that syntax, uh, there is an additional context called abstract syntax. So if I have, um, so for example, if I, um, yeah, let's open Vim again. So if I have, um, if I do something like in C or C++, if I do int A, okay, um, what, what, what will happen? What this line will do? Well, it will kind of declare a variable um, called A and it will make this variable of a specific type of type integer. And this is a concrete syntax. This is a concrete syntax that makes this kind of declaration, right? But if I do this declaration in, um, uh, in, some, in Golang, so if I do this, right? Um, it's the, the, the syntax is different. The concrete syntax is different, but the abstract syntax is kind of the same. It, it's, it's doing the same thing. 
So if I parse it and represent it as an abstract syntax tree node, um, it's very likely to be exactly the same node. Uh, so we have kind of the concrete syntax and we have an abstract syntax. Uh, and then we have some things which is called semantics. Uh, and semantics is what it means, right? So uh, if I do, if I do something like um, that int, int a equals 10, right? Again, that's C, C++. And then if I go Golang and I do um, a 10, right? Um, this is a declaration of the, of the variable. Uh, and I have an assignment and then I have a literal uh, 10. Um, so I have a couple of nodes. If I need, like this is a single line of syntax, of concrete syntax, but if I need to represent it as an abstract syntax tree, I'm really likely to have three nodes, right? I will have the assignment. Uh, then on one branch, I will have the declaration of the variable with the type specification. And on the other, I will have um, the literal, right? Um, in C and C++, it, it is, um, we, we have this concept of um, L value. So we also have L value and R value. Um, so this is, you know, um, a normal L value, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't done the, um, the homework for the C++, but it, it's not important here. What is important that I will have three nodes. So one node will be the assignment and the assignment has a left-hand side and right-hand side. And then the right-hand side of the assignment uh, will be the literal and the left-hand side will be the variable. Um, so then the node has two children, kind of a left side, which is the declaration of the variable, and right side, uh, which is the, the literal, right? And in Golang, I will have exactly the same. It's just that the concrete syntax is different and the type is inferred, right? Uh, in C, C++, we don't have type inference. So the type is provided you know, implicitly explicitly, I mean, it's, it's here. Uh, whereas in Golang, I have the type implicit, like it, the A will have type of, um, of integer, but I haven't specified it here. And then I have this uh, extra assignment thingy, which uh, initi like declares, uh, specifies the type and initia initializes the, the variable. So again, this line, this concrete syntax will be represented as a three nodes uh, with the variable, the literal, and the assignment. Um, and in the abstract syntax, they will be very alike. And then the semantics is kind of the same, right? So semantically, both of those lines are doing the same thing. They're declaring a variable and then assigning a, a particular value to it. So the semantics is the same, right? Even though the abstract syntax might slightly change and the concrete syntax is really different, right? I mean, it's not super different. Like it, it, it has certain characteristics which are similar. We, we have left side, right side. We have this equality sign kind of in both. So the concrete syntax is similar, but it's kind of different, right? Um, so the, you know, if, if you think about it, um, a lot of languages share the same semantics. Um, they might share some similarities in abstract syntax and the most differences are in the syntax, right? So the differences in the syntax are the most concrete. They change the most. The semantics doesn't change much. And that's why we have certain families of languages which share semantics. They are kind of the same. Semantically, they are the same, right? Um, and that provides us kind of a way of thinking, the, the way of structuring the problem or the way of thinking of something, right? Um, so we have family of languages called the descendant from C. Uh, so C and C++ are very similar. Uh, in many cases, the semantics is the same, or even syntax is the same, right? For the subset of C++, syntax is the same. Uh, C++ adds additional semantics and adds additional things which C doesn't have. So it is kind of like a, um, a superset, right? Where C being a subset. Um, and it provides a certain way of thinking. Um, it, it is the same with the uh, functional family of programming languages. So 
I have kind of a, a short exercise for you. Um, so try to think in a way of thinking, not in the syntax uh, way, but in the way of thinking of what, uh, what a loop is. So try to explain to somebody what is the concept of a loop, abstractly speaking. So the, the very first programming language that I learned was assembly. And in assembly, you don't, you don't have loops. Uh, you have jumps, right? Um, so you basically have a sequence of instruction of instructions, and then you have conditional or unconditional jump, right? So in, in assembly, you have, you know, uh, you have some instructions, um, instructions, 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 instructions. And then at some point you can have a jump. Let's say I, I can jump to line number five, right? Um, or I can say jump uh, if some, if, you know, uh, X is not zero. So jump not zero. And we usually we use the accumulator, and then I would say if if um, if the particular register is not zero, then jump to five, right? And that's what the loop was, but it was not called loop. It, it was just basically called jumps, right? So what you're saying is a recurring instruction, an instruction is repeated until a certain requirement is met. Do I task a number of times over and over? Um, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So uh, all those definitions kind of try to capture this reoccurrence of something. Like we try to repeat something over and over again, right? Um, but if I substitute, um, if I substitute now the, the term uh, loop here, with recursion, uh, would the definitions change a lot? So, so the question now is like, you try to explain what loop is um, and you gave me some definitions. So um, loop was the original question. Uh, and what if I ask you to replace loop with recursion? What would be the difference? So, you know, the first definition, recurring instruction. What, well, it, it fits to both, right? Uh, so an instruction is repeated until a certain requirement is met. Well, that kind of fits to recursion too. Do a task a number of times over and over. Okay, here we have a number of times, right? Um, so that is a little bit different. Maybe that is enough to differentiate between loop and recursion, right? Uh, recurring piece of code. So we, we have different types of loops, right? Some loops, have this concept of a number of times. Uh, some loops don't. Like I may have a loop which is a kind of a for loop. Um, so if I have a for loop and I have a certain um, number of times thing to do, right? Uh, or I have while and then just a logical condition type of loop, right? Uh, so then yeah, we, we already have some new ones here, right? Uh, we have a trap by a condition. So that is fine. That kind of fits kind of a while type of loop, but it doesn't kind of fit into the recursion. But th this is what I'm trying to get here. I'm trying to get you to kind of appreciate the, the slight nuance of what you have in your head when you're thinking about loops, uh, which is, you know, you know that the, the for loop is different than the while loop and also any type of loop is really kind of different than recursion, right? Uh, the recursion has sort of the, the end condition, but it's not specified explicitly. Sometimes the, the recursion has kind of a built-in stop condition and it will kind of recurse uh, until that stop condition is met or it can recurse indefinitely, right? But you know, you can have loops uh, which can be in, indefinite as well, right? We can have while true, right? 
while true is a type of a loop which goes forever, right? Uh, but there is a, a slight difference between when I say while true, and then I have a block of code which does something forever, or if I have a recursive call which goes on forever. They Again, they have kind of a different uh, mental model and they, they work differently, right? Um, so not everything that um, we, like if, if I go back to this one, um, like, we have the semantics and the way of thinking, but when you're doing programming, you're using your way of thinking of structuring and organizing the, the solution, right? Uh, so when, you, when I give you a task, if I tell you to do something, you first think what kind of abstractly you need to do, and then you kind of verify that what you need to do has a certain semantics in the, in the language that you wanna use, and then you kind of code it in a concrete syntax, right? But the programming is kind of done here. Like you, you're thinking, oh yeah, should I use like a loop or should I use a recursion, right? Um, so what other things apart from loops and recursion do you have in your vocabulary where you're thinking of solving problems? So give, give me in the chat other concepts that you use when you're thinking about programming, uh, when you are giving a task of, you know, what should, what, could you use? So we have recursion, we have loops, what else? What are the concepts you, you use? Yeah, we have variables, uh, so we mentioned that. So for representing state. What else do you use? Functions, yes, functions and in particular lib library functions. Exactly, those are super useful, right? Um, yeah, we have conditionals, so let's put them here. What else? Classes, exactly, so we have things like this. What else? Pattern matching. Perfect. So this is pattern matching. We can put structs here as well, right? So we have some data structures. We have functions and library functions that we can use. Uh, of course, we have, you know, we can represent state. Uh, we have some control flow things. We have more advanced things such as pattern matching. Uh, pattern matching in terms of um, yeah, code. Um, so code, you, you can also have, you know, regex is useful thing as well. Um, what else do you have? Yeah, we have various expressions and statements. So those are kind of the fundamental things. Expressions, statements. Um, all right, so th th those are kind of the, the vocabulary that we start thinking and putting together when we think about the problem, okay? So now um, pattern matching, um, let's, 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 let's structure it. So variables are kind of obvious um functions and library functions are obvious those two are kind of obvious as well so if we um let's say we need to write a program uh which um counts the lines of um of text in a in a text file so we need to kind of yeah we need to open a file uh so we have a concept of a handle to a file we have the concept of opening it, so library functions. And then um, counting the lines of code uh, or counting the lines of text, uh, we have to have some sort of concept of a buffer. We have to have some concept of iterating over line by line. We have to think, okay, should we read it line by line or should we read the whole thing? But what if the file is, you know, uh, 40 gig, like we can't fit it into 60 gig RAM if you only have 16 gig RAM, right? So maybe we have to have some sort of a chunk or buffer 
which uh, is used for reading. Uh, because we need to read the lines, that would be useful to kind of read line by line, but what if we happen to have a very long line? Uh, that's a problem. Uh, so we have kind of a um, you know, concept of a buffer. Uh, we have a concept of a handle. <clears throat> we have a con concept of iterating over something, right? Um, so yes, we can do iteration through loops or recursion, uh, but we often don't think in terms of loops and recursion. We think in terms of iteration, which is then translated into recursion or, or, or loops, right? Uh, and we have kind of a concept of counting. So, you know, we want to count something. I can count something using a variable and incrementing the variable, but I can also count using something else, right? Um, so we, like, if we, um, if we draw a line, we have some kind of a language constructs which we use. And then we again have kind of a more higher level uh, things that we, we use, right? So we, we did um, set loops and recursion uh, that we have, but we, we didn't say iterators, right? Do you know iterators from C++? Yeah, you know, and it's kind of a very useful abstraction, right? Um, so iterators is something that abstracts away the details of how the looping is done, right? Um, iterators, it's kind of a, 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 a useful thing. So, so you see, we, we building, um, it's kind of like an abstraction tower, right? So we have, um, we have those, um, we have those fundamentals here. Um, so we have, you know, the concrete syntax, blah, 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 all the way to way of thinking. But if we build on top of the way of thinking, we have already things that are kind of a lower um, abstraction layers, abstraction layers, such that like, you know, uh, concepts like uh, recursion or loops. Uh, and then we have kind of a higher, uh, higher abstractions, abstractions. For example, iterator, iterator, or a buffer, right? Um, or a handle, right? What is a handle? Well, it is kind of a type of variable, but it has certain properties. We usually need to initialize it, then we need to close it. It is kind of pointing to some resource, right? Uh, usually it's kind of about IO. Uh, it's not just a variable, right? Here I, I can say, yeah, I have a variable, right? Uh, that's kind of a lower level of abstraction. But if I say I have a buffer or if I have a handle, well, I do represent it in my code as a variable in a concrete syntax, of course, but I'm not thinking about variables. I'm kind of thinking about buffers and handles and iterators, right? Uh, maybe I have a counter, right? Um, so we have certain higher abstraction le levels, right? And then we can go again, like, you know, even higher abstraction layers, right? Um, and then we have things like, um, often we, we, you've experienced that if you've done any kind of a template, uh, template programming in C++, then you are kind of using some sort of abstraction, which is then used to generate the concrete code for you, right? You usually use templates to generate functions for you, right? So I have um, functions, um, they are here and here, right? So functions can be sort of simple, but functions can be more complex and they might uh, you be used for kind of a higher level of abstractions to generate other functions or to do something for you on a kind of a higher abstraction levels. And then templates are even more abstract because they usually generate functions for you, right? You, you're writing something that will be con like instantiated in a concrete function, uh, but it's not a function itself, right? Um, so what we want is we want to be as easily expressing stuff in this kind of abstractions, uh, higher abstractions, because then we can deal with complexity. Um, we often have problems that are so complex that if we focus on these lower levels, we will not be able to deal with it because it's just too complex. If you want to write it in kind of assembly, you will kind of uh, get bogged down by a lot of details that will kind of cloud your 
perception they will cloud your object um, the, the, uh, your, your own functioning your own productivity you need higher level of abstraction right that's why we have concept like structs uh, or types which organize us and make us kind of more productive because we push up we push up to those higher level of abstractions and some programming languages are quite good at it uh, they are quite easy to express a really complex things in kind of a succinct syntax and some languages are not very good at it they kind of stick to the sort of lower level of abstractions and they offer things kind of through library functions and those simple concepts right and uh, golang is kind of an example of this um, of those lower level of abstraction language so in Golang, you cannot really express generics because it doesn't have it, uh, which means you cannot do this kind of a more high level conceptual programming, which you can in some languages. You can do it in C++ or you can do some kind of a, um, you know, more abstract programming in C++ using templates and generics. In Golang, you can't. Uh, and then some languages are kind of in between or some languages are really up there. Um, so Haskell is an example which is really out there. Like it, it, it allows you to express in a concise, uh, expressive way a really complex structures which you can use for programming. Uh, Golang is kind of sits here. Rust sits somewhere in, in, in the middle. It, it, it sits higher than C++ and also it has a slightly, um, let's say nicer syntax. There are certain things like C++ is super powerful it's just that the syntax is kind of complex, such that if you want to express certain things, yeah, it's kind of really painful. Um, we, we will get we will get back to that. All right, so let's let's finish this. Um, we have yeah, we discussed the loop. Um, so all right, we have a quiz. Great. So when you're ready. Uh, join in a couple of simple, simple questions. Um, just to wake everybody up. All right, we have 20, 20 in. Come on, join in, join in. It's gonna be easy. Joining, joining. Yeah, one more and we start. All right. Excellent. So let's go. When was Haskell developed in? If you're really super fast in Googling, maybe you can do it. <laughs> but then you will lose points because the fast answers count better. So when was Haskell developed in? Yeah, great. So some of you probably got confused by the fact that there are two uh, main iteration of Haskell. So there is a Haskell 98, which suggests that the Haskell was developed in 90s. And there is a Haskell 2010, which is the current spec that we're using. Uh, but in fact, Haskell was developed in 80s. So those people who voted in the middle got it right. Um, this is a kind of a timeline of uh, programming languages. So we had an explosion of languages, programming languages in 70s. So C is the, the main, of course, the family of languages that we know. Uh, ML was the functional language developed in Scotland. Uh, in 72 and then in um, uh, we had the, the small talk being developed also in 72 as an example of different line of thinking um, about programming and that was the, the most object oriented kind of um, programming language right so here we had the functions and structs it was kind of a abstracting over an assembly, right? The origin was just from assembly, we kind of moved to higher level of abstractions. Here we moved from functions and lambda calculus. And here we kind of are designed thinking about problems in a different 
way of abstracting, but in abstracting in terms of objects, right? Uh, so we have kind of a three grandfathers of three different lines of programming. Um, and then we have a refinement. So uh, the refinement was that C was somewhat limited and it had borrowed, uh, some, some languages borrowed some concepts from Smalltalk and tried to mix C and, and Smalltalk, right? And those two are Objective C and C++. So Objective C was first and C++ was second. Uh, if you ever programmed in C++ and Objective C, you may like Objective C more. Objective C feels more object oriented. Uh, you basically have everything being objects and you send messages to those objects. And if you send a message which the object doesn't have, doesn't know what to do, there is a special default handler which will handle it, right? So it's kind of like if you have uh, a C++ class and you call a method which that class, that the instance doesn't know about. Well, you know, in C++ you cannot do that. You will just get a compiler error, error saying, wait a minute, you're trying to call a method of, uh, on, an, on an instance of a class which is not implemented. In Objective-C you can do that at runtime. And then in runtime you say, oh, what the hell? There was a method which I was called with, but I don't have it in my V table, so I need to do something with it, right? And you handle it yourself. Um, so C and Smalltalk kind of got married, and you have two examples, 84, 85. And at the same time, we had Miranda, which was kind of a, an improved functional language, um, which was commercial. And then the community said, well, this is a commercial language. We need an open source, open language. So they developed Haskell. Uh, so Haskell started in 86, 87, right? So if you think about it, they started in 87, but it took them um, 11 years to get to the first sort of standard, right? They were refining it and refining it and refining it until version 1.0 kind of happened, right? And it took 11 years. So you see the life cycle of Haskell is a bit on a slower side than most languages, right? So the first iteration took 11 years and then the second one took 12 years. And now we are in 2021. Maybe in a couple of years, you know, one, two, three years, we will have a new version of the, of the refinement. Um, the refinement happens by introducing it's the same in Rust. They introduce certain compiler flags, experimental compiler flags, and then people are free to try it, to use it. Uh, it's not in the core language. It's just a feature that exists. People can use it and get a feel if it's useful or not, if it's productive or not. And then after you know a couple of years, five, six years, uh, some of them become built in into the language and stop being just a compiler flags. They start being kind of a core of the language. And that's what happened between 98 and 2010. So those, are, those were the 80s. And then we have 90s. Uh, we have Python coming along. We have Java. Again, Java is, was sort of thought of a refinement of this object-oriented line of thinking. It kind of uh, borrows from, from C and C++ syntax, but it has some concepts and ideas from Smalltalk, and it kind of uh, refines the, the line. Uh, and then we have OCaml, which also refines the, uh, the functional programming line. Um, in functional programming, the biggest challenge is that um, it would be nice, theoretically, to have laziness, which Haskell has. But laziness introduces certain complexity of how you work with debuggers and how you work uh, logically with the flow of your program. Like you have to know how much time and space certain things will take if you're computing stuff. And then with lazy languages, uh, it is hard. So if you, for example, have a recursive call, which is lazy, uh, it's kind of really hard to tell how many stack frames it will take or how, you know, uh, how much space it will be occupying. Um, so sometimes it's better if the, some of the kind of recursive calls are strict such that they are evaluated at the time where they, when, when they happen instead of being evaluated when they are needed. Uh, because that allows you to predict or calculate or debug certain things more easily. And OCaml is kind of an example of you know, some fixes which are changing the way the program works in, internally. And then we have um, tw 2000s. And in 2000s, we have C-sharp, which was sort of the 
again, an improvement over the virtual machine concept of Java. So .NET, for example, is, uh, you know, technologically on the engineering side, it's a better VM than, than Java is. Uh, it has uh, more facility to do tail recursion and it can achieve certain things more efficiently. Um, such that it can deal with functional programming as well. So we have F sharp, which kind of came along in 2005, which is the, the functional line. Um, and then we have kind of a Golang and Rust uh, happening recently. And Go is sort of a refinement again of the C line of system programming with garbage collector built in. And Rust is the kind of more C++ line of thinking of you deal with your memory management sort of yourself and there is no garbage collector. Uh, so this is more for um, real-time systems and embedded systems. Go is more for networking and sort of uh, um, system programming, but a, a little bit higher level. Uh, for low level, like Rust is probably better. Um, so this is, you know, the big picture of how the languages came about. And um, I kind of like if you go to Wikipedia, um, so if you go Wikipedia, and you, for example, go to Haskell, to, to any of the programming languages. Um, why it's so slow, Haskell, yep. Haskell. Nice. Then you have kind of here, you have, um, what languages influenced the design of that language and uh, what this language influenced, right? So if you, if you go to Haskell, you can see a very long list of programming languages that Haskell influenced. Uh, and that means it, 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 like knowing Haskell will kind of tell you a lot about all those languages because they borrowed concepts and they borrowed this way of thinking from Haskell and re-implemented it using a different syntax, right? So if you already know the kind of abstract semantics or the abstract way of thinking in Haskell, then learning Scala, for example, is just learning syntax. You don't need to learn concepts because you already have them, you already know them, right? Um, so when you choose your next programming language that you want to learn, it's kind of good to check what would give you the most mileage, right? And that, that's one of the reasons why we chose Haskell is because you know Haskell in, in on this abstract level teaches you all those languages, right? So instead of learning 20 languages, you can just learn Haskell. And then if you really need any of those languages, you just need to learn the syntax of how it is expressed, right? Um, and of course, Haskell was influenced by Lisp and Miranda and, and Hope, which was another uh, programming language from Scotland. Um, and um, yeah, you can kind of, uh, you can check that, check that out. So if, if we go to Rust, um, Rust programming language, uh, you have the same and you see that the, uh, the languages it influenced is quite small. Well, you know, it's not surprising because it's quite a young language, uh, but you can see what language has influenced it. So you, you see OCaml, you see Haskell and you, you see NewSqueak, the Squeak, which is what, which was the um, small talk. Um, it, it's a, a newer small talk, right? Um, so th this is kind of a useful, useful thing to check, like uh, how the languages relate to each other and how they influence each other. Uh, because it's useful to learn the languages which are, which are having this kind of a most coverage in terms of this abstract, um, abstract way of thinking. All right, so one more, one more thing. Um, so F sharp is the .NET based functional programming language, which has strict evaluation. So it's not lazy like Haskell, but it, it is functional language. It just have the uh, kind of a, some of the laziness taken out. Um, and uh, one year ago, when I was preparing the, the lecture for the Golang people, um, I checked and um, F sharp was the highest paying programming language. So on average, if you had kind of a job uh, which require you to be a programmer, um, different programmer use 
different languages. And then if you run statistics, statistically speaking, the highest paying jobs were in F sharp, right? Um, so that was sort of the, um, yeah, uh, reinforcement that knowing functional programming and kind of functional concepts kind of pays off. Uh, Haskell is quite high up as well, but mostly because there is not a lot of uh, Haskell programmers. Maybe F sharp is similar. The marketplace is a little bit tight, therefore the salaries are better, right? So in a marketplace where there is a lot of competition, like you know, for example, JavaScript, uh, a lot of people know JavaScript such that the kind of salaries are pushed down because there is a lot of competing offers, right? But maybe in more niche languages like Haskell or F sharp. Uh, the salaries are higher because uh, there is less competition. I don't know. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, we uh, we have uh, yeah we've done that. So Haskell is it was born by uh, the research community because they wanted an open alternative to commercial languages. Uh, the latest iteration of the standard 2010. Uh, the next one probably coming, you know, uh, some, uh, sometime soon. All right, we have one more um, quiz. So you know a little bit more about Haskell already. So in your own opinion, what would you think is the, the biggest, the most important aspect of Haskell? Um, All of them are correct. You just need to pick which one, in your opinion, is the most important. Um, those are all properties of Haskell. Um, so that it is purely functional. Um, yeah, um, it, it, it is um, one of the most distinguishing feature features. Um, to me, uh, there are other purely functional languages and the kind of the, the most distinguishing feature for Haskell that I, I think it's important for me is that it has very concise syntax. Um, I kind of like the laziness. I have trouble because of the laziness, as I said, like uh, in imperative programming, you can debug program quite easily, you know, go step by step. In lazy language, that, that you know, there are no steps. Like um, things are lazy, so if you don't need anything, nothing happens. Uh, so debugging is kind of a nightmare. Uh, but they, yeah, there are some tricks to do that. So I kind of like, I like Haskell because of that, right? So I, I show you something. So if you, if you need to write a function which adds two numbers, okay, uh, what normally you need to do? Well. In programming like um, like C, let's say I have a function fun, which adds two numbers. So I would have to say uh, something like this, and I would have to say return a plus b, right? Um, correct. I hope that's kind of a a, a function which uh, adds two numbers in C. Um, I could so add two integers, right? Um, I could go a little bit higher abstraction level and say, well, I don't really need to know what type it is. So I could um, define, so I could use define and I could define a macro, uh, which if given kind of a fun one and two would kind of uh, replace it with, um, uh, one plus three, right? Or if I gave it fun um, one point point zero and three dot one, it would replace it um, with this, right? So I could write a macro, and uh, I, I have the ability uh, in C plus plus at least, but pro probably in C it would all also work uh, to define a macro that would do that, but. You know, a macro is, let's consider it a bit of a cheat, right? So I don't want a macro, I want a kind of a, a program, right? So then if I want to have the same function for floats, I would have to write it again, right? So I have to say there is another function uh, which uh, takes two floats, 
Um, and in some programming languages, um, oops. Um, yeah, of course, if it takes floats, it needs to return float, right? Uh, in some programming languages, I could do that. Uh, in some programming languages, the compiler would say, wait, 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 wait a minute. Um, it's fair if you want to change parameters, but the return yeah, it has to be the same as the previous one, right? I, I cannot deal with kind of a polymorphism that where you changing the return type, right? So then I would have to call it, you know, float and call this one int, right? <laughs> Um, in some languages, it's fair, it's fine. In some languages, it's not, right? But that's generally what you need to do in programming languages to define, you know, at two numbers, right? Um, given integers or fractional, right? Um, in Haskell, if you want to define fun, that it's a function that adds two numbers, it's this. That's all, right? Um, so, you know, if, if you, if you look at this, uh, if you look at those two definitions, um, and here I have, uh, return, return a plus B, right? Um, so the essence of the, of the logic, the essence of this function is this plus symbol here, right? That, that's all what makes this fun to be the addition, not a subtract, subtraction or a product, right? If I want to re rewrite it to be a product of those two numbers, I have to change this one single symbol, right? So everything else is a just boilerplate, right? <laughs> so if you think about it, all of this, apart from that one symbol is boilerplate, right? So in Haskell, all the boilerplate is taken out. Like you do, just don't deal with it, right? So some languages are very concise and they are quite expressive. Some languages you have to write quite a lot of boilerplate, right? For example, Java. I, I really like Java. Like I programmed in, in Java for like 15 years and I love the language. But while you start using some more concise languages and while you start using some kind of more abstract way of thinking about problems and then you have to code it, you get really annoyed by typing. Right? You, you just don't want to type that much. You want to type less. And you're asking yourself, why do I have to type so much? And in Java, you keep asking yourself that question a lot. Right? It, it is kind of similar in C++. Like, uh, you know, Java is not the worst. Like, uh, C++ is probably even worse than that in terms of how much you have to type to express one sing single thing that you have in your head. Right? So um, to me, this is kind of the biggest selling point of Haskell, right? Um, I kind of, yes, it's purely functional. I can make, you know, I can try to make um, other programming languages try, try to make them quite pure uh, by making functions that are kind of pure, um, but I cannot get this, con you know, the, 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 um, the syntax. I, I have to type a lot, right? So with other languages like, even in C++, I can type functions. So if, if I have to um, um, define functions in, in a way that always depend on the parameters, that there is no side effects, that those functions are pure, I can kind of do that. I can force myself to program in a pure way. Uh, it will not be lazy, of course, but it will be pure, right? Uh, I don't have any side effects and I can express my programs using kind of a purely functional paradigm in C++. It will be sometimes a bit painful, but the biggest pain will be the syntax. I mean, I will have to type a lot of stuff. Uh, the language is not designed to be purely functional. Um, so, so to me, this is the kind of the, the, uh, the biggest selling point. All right, so let's uh, quickly see. Uh, oh yeah, we had kind of a leaderboard. Yeah, we didn't have a, much of a quiz today just two questions with one being uh, super uh, personal um, one being a little bit a little bit of a question so congratulations to Nicholas um, Haskell again um, so in imperative programming um, we think how to do some things how to achieve something right so if I if I'm giving a task 
and I know I need to express it in C, C++, Hus uh, Rust. Uh, Rust, not, not so much, uh, maybe Golang. I have to kind of really think in an imperative way. Um, in some languages like Haskell or Rust to some extent, I can think more of what something is instead of how to achieve something. And that is, um, that takes kind of a practice. It, it, it is, I mean, you understand that those two statements, but they don't sink in. They, they it, you need some time, right? So I, I, I spent uh, quite a lot of time programming in Lisp uh, and Lisp is kind of a functional language, but it's not purely functional uh, and it's not, so much declarative that it's actually quite imperative. Um, so I'm quite familiar with lists and with pro list, list processing and with some of the concepts like folds and, and things like this and kind of a list comprehensions. But some concepts in, in Haskell and some kind of a declarativeness of the way of structuring your thinking kind of takes time to get used to. Uh, it's not super intuitive. So um, for those of you who uh, already know some functional, pure functional programming concepts that, that will be easier. For those of you who only program in an imperative way, um, I suggest you go slow. You, you don't skip over some of the thinking and some of the way to work with recursion or to work with folds or zips uh, because that's, you, you have to kind of get it into your head and, and start uh, kind of thinking about it uh, while you're thinking about the problem uh, because it, it is different. So. It's good if you kind of try not to think about problems in an imperative way, but try to clear your head and say, okay, how can we approach the problem from a different angle, from thinking about it, you know, differently. Um, so yes, so Haskell is lazy. I talked a little bit about what lazy means before. It's statically typed, it's purely functional, it's very concise. Um, we will kind of deal with all those um, as we move along. Um, and, um, it's a little bit chicken and egg, right? To really learn the language. So if we, if we go to the original slide, uh, which we started with, right? I, I'm not, um, I, I don't want to scroll the menti, but I will kind of revise it here. So I, I will write it. Uh, we had the syntax, we have the kind of abstractions and kind of the, the way of thinking, right? Um, we really want to be learning here. We really want to learn about this new way of thinking about problems of making those higher abstractions, but we cannot do that without having kind of a concrete syntax, right? Uh, we need to have a way of expressing what we mean. Uh, so we have kind of a chicken and egg because we would like to learn the language by being here, but we need that first. So we, we, we need to kind of get um, the syntax uh, before we can do this, but talking about syntax is boring. I mean, you know, syntax is, is easy. Like you can read a tutorial about Haskell syntax and it will not teach you Haskell, right? Haskell is not about syntax. S same as, you know, C++ is not about syntax neither. Um, yeah, so chicken and egg, like, you know, we want to be here, but we cannot be here without this and this is boring. So, well, you know, we have to start with boring stuff first uh, before we can get to some kind of more fun, right? Um, so let's start with the hello world. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with the classic. Um, so I, um, I have uh, here, uh, we, we can do two, two things, right? So you should have the Glasgow um, uh, REPL, like the, the command um, executor. So if you go um, GHCI, you will get into kind of the live interpreter and you can uh, define functions and you can execute functions here. And it's super useful in, in learning Haskell because it's a mechanism for checking, um, for checking uh, types and kinds of, of things that we work with and to try th quickly things out. Because Haskell is so concise, Sometimes you can, when you're writing code in your, in your editor, but you want to re refresh yourself. Okay, what was the syntax? What was the type? Having kind of the, uh, the REPL opened is very, um, very useful, right? So um, there are two ways of printing Hero World. One is to use print um, and, you know, we can do this. 
and that will print hello world. And then we have a more stream based um, for string line, um, hello world, and then that will print stuff out as well, right? Uh, with the new line at, at the end. Um, print really doesn't really print anything to the screen. Uh, it's only working here in the REPL uh, because what print does, it converts whatever expression we give it as a parameter, um, it converts it to a string. And then it just prints that string, but it only prints it here. Uh, whereas this one will actually work in the, um, yeah, in like standard IO. So if I write, um, so if I write uh, hello, hello Haskell, um, then if I want to write hello world, I have to have an entry point. Uh, so the entry point in Haskell, well, let's guess it's called main. Uh, and then uh, the uh, equality sign is used for defining functions. So um, I'm saying main is a function which is defined as uh, and then I can do this um, hello world, right? And now I have a program which has a function main, which is defined as printing hello world. I can uh, save it and I can use the compiler to compile it into um, the executable. And as you can see, it generates um, an object file. So if I uh, list my, what I have here, I have my hello Haskell source code. While building the executable, it generated the object file and a kind of an interface file, which are not useful for you at that point. And then I have the executable. So if I uh, execute hello world, I have hello world out, right? Um, quite straightforward, uh, quite concise syntax. Uh, there is quite a lot of magic happening with the, uh, with the um, this line, uh, but you know the typical thing we have the entry entry point, um, and then we have kind of a definition of what uh, happens when the entry is called. So when main is called, this sequence of of instructions is executed. Um, so it's quite uh, similar to you know Python, let's say. Um, but uh, Python doesn't have an entry point, right? Uh, so it would just have print and, and text. Uh, we will come back to this uh, a little bit later. Um, what I want to do is focus on uh, functions, right? So let's um, see what I have here. Um, so we have uh, here, um, uh, yeah, let's, let's do it in the, Let's do it in the interpreter. So if I do the same thing in the interpreter, so I say uh, put string line, hello, right? So of course, hello is a parameter of this function, right? So put string line is a function which takes a parameter. I have a literal, which is a string, double quotes, no, no magic here. But the magic is kind of how I declared what main is, right? So main uh, is a function which um, let's use in the in, um, the REPL, you have something called colon T and it tells you a type of stuff, right? So if I say, what's the type of hello? It says, oh yeah, it's an array of characters, which is effectively a string, right? Uh, an array of characters is the same as string. So if I say, what is a string? Well, it doesn't know what string is I because string is a primitive type. Uh, I can ask what kind of type is string and it says, well, it is a primitive type, right? Uh, everything that is a star is a primitive type. So another primitive type is int. Int is also a primitive type. Um, but if I ask what type is main, it says, well, main is uh, something that um, produces an IO action. Yeah, we, we don't need to deal with it right now. Um, let's do a simpler function, the, the plus function that I told you right before. So let's define fun, which takes two parameters and it returns them, right? Um, okay, and ask what type is fun. 
and we see that fun, so the double colon is a specification of type. Uh, so if I want to dec declare, let's say, dec declare a variable A, um, let's not use the same name because it's a bit confusing. Let's say B uh, equals 10, um, but I want 10 to be an integer. Um, and then let's say let C equals 10, but I don't specify the type. I let Haskell infer the type. Uh, and now let's check what type is C. Let's say what type is B first. So no surprisingly, B is of type int. And if I check of what type is C, it will say, well, I don't really know what C is. I know that it has to have a certain meta type, which is called number, right? Uh, numbers can be fractional or integer. Uh, so because that 10 is a polymorphic literal, it can be either float or integer. Uh, Haskell says, well, I, at that point, I don't know, but I know that uh, C has some type, but this will be a numerical type. Uh, Haskell has a quite complex type system uh, such that we have the, the primitive types uh, and then we have kind of a higher order types uh, which we can do some computations with. Uh, and it, it is kind of like templates or generics or type classes or traits. In different programming languages, they, they have kind of a different names. Uh, in Haskell, those things are called type classes. Uh, in Rust, they are called traits, uh, for example. So yeah, let's let's come back to our function. So we have um, fun that takes <clears throat> two numbers and returns the, the sum. You will say uh, in in, uh, in the REPL, I can redefine things. I can say that function now is something else. And I can also say that A is something else. In normal program, once you define something, then you cannot really redefine it. Like it's it's, you know, immutable like so uh, we will move to uh, programming using the source code files from next class but here we will stick to the uh, to the repo and in the repo I can re redefine so you, you've seen that I have defined fun as taking two parameters and returning a value right and if I don't specify what type fun is uh, Haskell will infer what type the, the function will have. Um, I can specify what, fu what fun type is by do doing the double colon and then specifying the type, type of things, right? So for example, I can say that uh, fun uh, takes integer and another integer and returns an integer. And it will be a different function than the one inferred by Haskell uh, because if we remind ourselves what um, what type fun was, you see that it says there is a certain type with uh, the first first parameter, um, certain type with the second one. It, it's the same type for both, and it's the same type for the output. But we don't know what the, this type is because it, it is just a number. So this function is polymorphic because you can pass floats, you can pass integers, you can pass kind of large integers, and it will work as long as the type for both parameters and the output is the same. Uh, this A is a type variable. So it de declares that the type of fun is kind of some sort of function which takes two parameters and returns a parameter, uh, uh, returns the output value, but the type has to be the same. Uh, a is not a type. I mean, A is, uh, you know, types uh, with capital letters like uh, float, um, bool, and so on. Uh, but A is just a type variable, right? It's a variable which represents a type. And the only constraint on the type is this um, thing before the this arrow, which says what constraints on a type do I have? And in this declaration, the constraint is that it has to be a number. Why? Because I'm doing an addition. Um, <clears throat> if I do if I do fun, which takes a parameter and just returns it, <clears throat> and I check what type my fun is, there is no constraint. It says, 
you know, I don't care. It's some type that you take in and some type that you take out. Um, P is again a, a type variable and Haskell says, I don't care what type you, you put. So if I call fun hello, it will say hello. If I say fun uh, number, it will say number, right? Uh, because again, the function is polymorphic. Um, and it is polymorphic. Um, so let's go here. Um, Vim, we had this um, int fun int a polymorphic function and int fun float a, right? So fun is polymorphic because I can call fun with a integer. I can call fun um, with a float, right? Um, if I could change the output type also, I would have more powerful polymorphism. Uh, and this more powerful polymorphism you have in Haskell, right? So in Haskell, I can change the return type and the parameters type, uh, kind of depending on what I pass into it. Right, so we, we have kind of a, a, a function type, right? So the function type is this. So if I say fun, take some type and returns the same type, you will see that fun is a function which takes one parameter and returns an output value and the parameter and the output must be the same type. What will happen if I do this? It will say, well, it takes something of one type and returns something of another type. Um, and it can be the same type, but it doesn't need to be the same. What if I use concrete types? Uh, well, you will see, okay, fun is a function which takes integer and returns an integer, right? So I can define uh, a function, for example, a um, that um, returns a plus plus one. Oh, come on. And I want it to be a function which takes integer and returns an integer. Um, so it complains, yeah, so I would have to probably put that, um, Yeah, it's a little bit complicated. Normally you do it, uh, let, let me do it in the, um, in the um, hello thingy. So let's not use main. Um, yeah, let, let's use main, but let's say I have a function fun, which takes integer and returns an integer and fun is uh, declared as it takes a um, parameter a. Uh, and it returns a plus one. Um, if I do this, I constrained what a is, um, and I only constrained it to, to the to int, right? So if I later want to do a fun like this, uh, Haskell will complain. You see, it's like it's complaining that uh, you cannot, um, yeah, so. Let's do a little bit differently. So if I have more than one thing to do in main, I have to put them into a do block. Uh, so we can print hello world, of course, but if I want to call fun uh, with 1.0, um, then uh, Haskell will kind of complain that, uh, it, it complains for different reasons here. Um, it complains that it doesn't return the IO action. So let me fix that by saying let A equals this. Uh, and then it will kind of uh, complain that we don't return an IO action. So let's put string line exclamation mark at the end. And now it complains about the, the thing that I wanted to show you that it should complain about, <laughs> which is uh, it complains, so read here. Um, we don't have an instance uh, which is fra fractional 
Uh, so I'm putting a fraction here to fun because fun only takes integers, right? Uh, if I uh, comment that out and let Haskell to infer uh, to infer what the um, oops what the type of the function is. Oh come on. Um, so now it will work fine, right? Because now fun is a polymorphic and the uh, A is a variable here, a parameter variable, which the body uses, uh, but the type of fun is polymorphic. It can be any number um, because you know I can use it with floats or I can use it with integers. But if I do declare my type, then I told Haskell that A can only be ints. It cannot be fractions, right? Um, so you can let Haskell infer your type of your functions, uh, but sometimes you have to um, do it explicitly because you want precisely something that Haskell may not get, right? It will not infer that you mean integers here. It will make a polymorphic one, which will take any number, right? Um, so the function type is something that you declare using the columns. Uh, function definition is something that you declare with the equality sign. Uh, function arguments is kind of the same as with the normal programming. Um, and then the function application is kind of the, the space. Like we don't use the brackets, same as we don't use brackets here. It's just the space. So the space is kind of you applying the, 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 the function. Um, and the important part, which I will um, go back to the, uh, the interpreter is that uh, when I do when I do declaration of the type and I say a a a is not a parameter is a parameter for the type, not the parameter of the function. Uh, when I say a equals a uh, a or a plus one. Now a is um, the parameter. It's a kind of a variable representing the parameter of the function. Do, do you get? It's a little bit confusing um, with the type system, but we will kind of uh, deal with it as we move along. So remember that this is kind of like declaring a type, uh, and then this is defining the the function. If you want to define a function with two parameters. Um, you can kind of do it like this, but because plus takes two parameters, uh, then I can skip the parameters because, um, yeah, okay, we, we, we do it uh, on Thursday. Um, so uh, for now, uh, make kind of a mental mapping of parameter functions, uh, A, B, C. Uh, by convention, you can call them whatever you want. We usually start with ABC if, or X, Y, Z. Uh, if you have a list, usually we say um, we use S like in English, making it plural, right? All right, so we are running out of time uh, and we have uh, quite a number of slides left. We have the kind of a basic... Um, basic types, uh, which are true, false, numbers, strings, kind of in a tuple. So let's continue uh, on Thursday. I will hope that the Menti session will kind of retain the state. Uh, and then we continue with the uh, basic types and kind of a basic uh, doing something with basic functions. OK. Uh, do you have any questions? I'm sorry, I, I kind of was ranting too long and I ran out of time today. Uh, even though I was trying to be concise and trying to make a short number of slides, I, I still went over. So uh, I'm working on it. All right, so I will see you guys um, on Thursday. Thanks. See you. <laughs>